Hey, it's time for Dreamcatcher, the program where you can find peace through understanding your dreams and visions. I'm Robin Hardin. Today, my studio guest, once again, is Wayne Faust, the author of 300 Billion to One. Don't let that title fool you. This is a true love story. But we're going to begin with Pam Henson, who had a dream so important that she caught me right after a church service to share. I dreamed that my husband and I had gotten a new house and it happened really quick like overnight we had a new house and we uh, moved in had the keys and everything and there was a lady that had lived there before us and she had told my mother who was not here at the time that everything that's in the basement we could have so it's all ours and so we move in with our three children and we go to the basement we've been in the house maybe one night go to the basement ton of stuff in there I mean like new clothes children's stuff and all I'm thinking is oh we could consign these and get money new totes I mean like nice carry yeah. totes with all kinds of stuff and everything was neatly organized it was full and I looked at my husband and I said, are you sure that she told my mom we could have everything in here and she wasn't going to come back and get some of the stuff? Well, then I remember just walking through the house and um, there were these two men that come through my house and literally walked through it and were talking and then walked out. And I went on the front porch and I said, can I help you? And the gentleman said, oh, we're just looking. We're going to buy this house. And I said, no, I'm sorry. This is our house. We have the keys. We've moved in. Do you not see all of our things? And he said, no, it's, it's in foreclosure or something. There's something special about it so we can get a really good deal on it. And I said, well, no, that's, that's not true. And he said, well, if so-and-so wants it, he will do anything he can to get you out of this house. He doesn't care if you bought it or not. Mm -hmm. And he said there was some legal something that it might be to where we would get overridden. And I was not offended. I was just like the audacity of someone <laughs> thinking that. Yeah. And so then this other gentleman is walking around and he's walking, he's looking, it was it was land, it was a, a big barn was with it, a big house. And he said, I think I'm gonna pay $50 for this house. And I looked at him and I thought, that must be that man they're talking about. How dare he? What is he thinking? And I said, who does he think he is? And he said, oh, that's not the man I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, if he wants it, he will get it. Get ready. And I said, do you not realize I have three small children? And I do. My oldest is 13, almost 13. And I thought she wasn't there. And he goes, well, I see the two little boys. He looked concerned, like, like oh, well, we'll leave you alone then. And then he goes, well, where's the other one? And I said, well, she said, I have friends. And I started getting fearful that if he knew she was not little bitty, that he would mm -hmm. proceed. And then I woke up. This is Pam, and she goes to my church. You can see the church is just letting out. But what an awesome dream the Lord just showed her. A house is our lifestyle. The Lord is getting ready to give you a an upgrade in your lifestyle and I believe that could be physical as well as spiritual the uh, there's going to be quite of an abundance involved because the lady has given you she's left this stuff for you that's also representing inheritance mm -hmm. that the Lord's spiritual inheritance that he has for you more than you even think could possibly be but he's also showing you that um, the world, the two men represent the world, and they really kind of invaded your space. They came into your house uninvited, and they're checking it out. And that's what the enemy does. He comes into our lives, and he's checking it out, and he's threatening you, he's intimidating you, and he's making you think, well, so-and-so wants this, he can get it. And you even gave information about your family to him, which we have to be so careful. There's so many scams on TV, on, on computers. They, the, the enemy is trying to get our information. So this is kind of an instruction also to don't give away more to the enemy than, than is necessary. Because think of the enemy as in the court. Everything you say can and will be used against you. And that's what the enemy is doing to you in this dream. He's collecting this information to use against you. But you have the authority. And in the dream you knew it, but you weren't firm in it. So be firm in the authority that the Lord has given you because the enemy is looking and will do anything 
to take it away. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> My guest today, Wayne, you might think you're watching a rerun because he was here last week, but his story is so interesting and there's so much to tell. I'm going to let him give a, a, a brief summary, but you can watch last week's program either on Facebook or on YouTube to get the full story of this love story that is, sounds like fantasy but is so true. And Wayne, thank you for coming out and sticking around. This has been my pleasure. so good. We've been talking about your book and your wife, and I'll let you give a brief summary because some people are tuning in today and weren't here last week. Yes. Well, um, last week I did talk about the central miracles for which the book is titled 300 Billion to One because the, the central miracles which inspire inspired the, the very book to be written were just two uh, of, of the miracles. But what I talked about last week was when I cried out in desperation for something, when I said, Lord, here I am, a licensed therapist. I'm, I'm the one that's hit bottom, and I need a miracle. I, I don't know how I can move on. Mm -hmm. I've known this woman for 40 years. We are inseparable. I just don't know how to live without her. I wished and told you, take me, not her. Well. As I spoke last week, God sent her back to visit me two weeks after she passed away because I cried out and I needed something and I said, I don't know what I need. And he sent her back to me looking like this. The cover of the book uh, shows you the way she appeared to me. And this is actually her real face, but uh, the artist uh, drew the robe as I saw it. and. Uh, she appeared to me that night without her catheters hanging from her, uh, draining the liver. Mm -hmm. She was young, healthy, wearing a multicolored robe as she came to me. And she embraced me all night long, Robin. It was like a warm blanket. And I slept through the night eight hours instead of a normal six without ever getting up, which is a miracle by some <laughs> people's measure. <laughs> it's a miracle anyway. True. Um, as we get older, we take that for granted, but I, I slept through, and I was so full of energy, spiritual energy and physical energy, mental. I mean, you know, it was just like I couldn't contain myself, and, and I was so happy and thankful to God that I wrote it down in my grief journal. Thank you, Lord, for this miracle. Help me not to forget it a week or a month from now. And then I explained also in our last episode that while I was still writing, Help me not to forget about this and be a whiner or a complainer in a week, Lord. He had already transcended time and space yeah. to passively create another miracle concurrent with this one. And here's what happened. While I'm still writing that, help me not to forget, he sends a neighbor to my door from Brentwood, Tennessee, <laughs> to tell me that she had a dream of Wanda last night. Mm -hmm. And I was going to tell her about my experience. I said, you go first. And she explains her dream in exact same detail as my experience. She said Wanda came to her young, healthy, wearing a multicolored robe, only said one thing to her, tell me when you see Wayne, please give this to him. And Wanda gave her a hug and embraced her. Mm -hmm. That's when I said, tell me, I don't need to tell you what happened to me last night. Your mm -hmm. dream happened while, she was ex while I was experiencing her embrace for real everything down to the letter and the color of a robe that you dreamed is exactly the way it happened with me. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, what do you think about your odds now? <laughs> Are you still going to complain? <laughs> Write it down. And that mm -hmm. became the title of the book because the odds of somebody one day in 30 years having the same dream mm -hmm. as your experience is over 300 billion to one. Now, uh, but God gave me several other miracles, and I think that's why you wanted me here for a second episode. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, oh, yeah I, Angel gave us some cars. Yeah, we got them from here, the Joseph's warehouse. Yeah, yeah, and, and the Myers a booster seat. Mommy and my daddy always tell you need a booster seat. Yeah. You need a booster seat. <laughs> and you got one, didn't you? And baby sister got a big car seat. Yep.
you, you really have got to watch last week's program to really see the, how in-depth this is. But the Lord came to Wayne and sent his wife Wanda back to him for Wayne. But also, he sent Wanda to a neighbor for the neighbor. God is our father, and he's looking down, and his one son is crying and upset. His daughter's angry, and with one thing, he can bring them both together. Amazing, amazing. Now, with this title is based on the big, the big dream, and, and I'm with you. I believe you had an experience, and the neighbor dreamt your experience at the same yes. time. But since then, I've had uh, a series of dreams that have changed in nature yes. over this last six yes. years. I love when you talk about that experience you had with her coming back was revelatory and comforting. Those are both characteristics in the Bible for the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. Yes. And he says, ask me and I will reveal things to you. I the will show, tell you of things yet to come. I mean, those are, that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Which confirms Amen. that this wasn't some kind of witchcraft thing. No. This was the Holy Spirit yes. sending this. And this isn't the only thing. There's more, uh, more passive ones that we want to hear about too. Here's what happened. At age 17, I came from a very dysfunctional family, but at age 17, my alcoholic father, who beat my mother and beat me if I got between them, he got saved. Wow. God forgave him, and we all forgave him because he became a different person. Yes. Uh, he was, up to that point, he smoked like a chimney, drank like a fish, mm -hmm. and ran around uh, like a philanderer, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden he's a changed man. Lord. And I, and he quit hurting me and my mother yes. and everybody. And so our family was reunited, and that's where hope began. I, I start the first chapter crying out in despair, and I said, well, where, I need hope. Where did hope begin? And I, I reflect on my life, and I see God was on, in my life and in my father's life from the very beginning. And when we choose to serve him, we see his presence, we see his miracles unfold, but we have to, in faith, faithful obedience, serve God, and expect the, mm -hmm. the miracle. Yes. If you expect it, He shows up in the details. Yes. In fact, sometimes even when you don't expect it, He shows <laughs> up in the details to prove a point. Yes. I was here all along. All along, yes. So as I look back and reflect it, I realized that right after I got saved, I got drafted to the Army, and I said, hey, I'm a conscientious objector. I have to be because I just gave my heart to the Lord. I can't start killing people. Yeah. I'm 19 now. <laughs> I've, been, uh, you know, I've been serving God as a youth pastor. And so I said, surely, Lord, you won't take me into the yeah. war zone. But lo and behold, I kept saying that, and all of a sudden I'm wearing full gear. You know, I just got done going through the exercise with this bayonet and <laughs> stabbing the, the dummy and saying, kill, kill, kill without mercy, kill. And I didn't say it with any passion at all. Because <laughs> you, know, you weren't I, going. <laughs> I wasn't going to go. He was going to rescue me the last minute. I'd go be a chaplain's assistant, right? Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a helicopter, and they say, jump. You know, and you have to jump in, uh, 10 or 15 feet into a field of weeds where you can't even see the <sighs> ground and hope you don't you know, hurt yourself. And... Um, Generally, the miracle started because half of my platoon twice got wiped out while I was in Vietnam. And um, I realized the hand of God was on me, and I knew that when I was there. I didn't fear that I was going to die. People all around me feared. And they, they saw there was something special about my faith, and they would talk to me about God. Anyway, God spared me through that. And those are passive miracles. Mm -hmm. God's hands on you for a reason. Yeah. Back in Jeremiah, I know my plans for you. Yes. Not to harm you, but for you to prosper. And I know the number of hairs on your head. I know what. So his plans for all of us to live out our lives the way it should be, to serve him and others, is there if we seek it. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. Now notice I didn't say for everything. No, no. In everything. It's a difference. I don't praise God for the sickness, I praise Him in it. Because I know He's going to break through. 
Join Pastor Johan at Love's Way Church Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. And that's the beauty for this book. Regardless of the age of the reader, you start as a young man in Vietnam and you haven't met her yet. And then you bring us all the way to meeting her and falling in love. And we fall in love. We just fall right in love with you guys. It's just, it's awesome how it's read. And then you take us to the end of her life in, in that a book that size. I mean, well, I, actually, I had to rushed. cut out four chapters to get it to that size. It's, it's not rushed. It's, it's not, not jumpy. Well. It, it just, I, I really loved it. And what a story. Well, thank you. Because the title could almost scare you away if you're like, oh dear, I hope this isn't a scientific book. It's, I'm just so impressed with it because it's, you can tell it's intelligently written, but very easy and very engaging. And you just, I didn't, I read it cover to cover without stopping. Wow. I read it cover to cover thank and I'm you. not a person who does that. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I'm going to be very honest with you. When I was talking to God and writing down in my grief journal the odds and the title of this book mm -hmm. and everything. He told me, this will become a book. You're going to write it. I heard that soft voice, and it will eventually become a movie. Now, he didn't say, oh, you know, it will by mm -hmm. July 30th, mm -hmm. 2000 and whatever. But um, I'm praying the same way Abraham and Elizabeth prayed for a child the right. same way Jacob right. prayed for a wife before mm -hmm. he met mm -hmm. uh, Rachel at the well. Mm -hmm. And before I pray for my wife, mm -hmm. I'm still praying for a script writer and a right. producer because I understand it's much more than I can afford. Right, right. And I know it's going to happen. Whether it happens in my lifetime or right. not, it's still the mm -hmm. tribute and the legacy. Right that my wife deserves and that God deserves. God deserves, His glory has to live on. Mm -hmm. He will shine through all of our mm -hmm. experiences in the culmination of books or movies or whatever we present. Well, when you go to Amazon and you read the reviews and you read, my review says, this reads like a movie. This is the first time you told me that. <laughs> so I don't want them to think that I took this. No. I mean, it reads like a movie. I, could, I felt like I was watching it rather than reading it. And so I see it as a movie. It is, I feel like I, had, I, feel like I know her. I feel like I have watched this your all's life story. At the time of the, right now, today, how long ago was this? Did she pass away? Uh -huh. She passed away uh, November the 11th of 2012, and that is almost six and a half years. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone who's lost loved ones, that's still fresh. It still seems fresh to me. Mm -hmm. Because the, whole, the world just keeps going. My grandbaby died one month and one day after 9-11. And I was just so offended that people are grieving people they don't even know, you know? Like, you don't know the people and you're grieving them and my grandbaby died. And there's such a offense that happens that the world keeps going. And six years later, I think I was still a little bit like, it's just not fair, the world is still going and I don't have a grandbaby. And she wasn't a year old. And it's just so fresh. And I mean, even in your profession, you know all this. Instead of saying, God, why did this happen to me? We should be saying, what do you want me to learn from this that's, experience? Yeah, that's when you know you're starting to heal. Even though you hit all those depressions and angers, it's like, what, what am I supposed to learn from this? I remember I said out loud in the car on the way to the hospital the last time. I said, I don't care if other people's babies die. I don't care. I don't want to be the one that has to talk to them and tell them I know how they feel. I don't, I don't want this. Yeah. I mean, because you, oh, you know, you're just like, I don't want this. But then when she did pass, I thought she was going to, I knew she was going to live. I knew it to the point, because of my faith, that when she was in the mortuary, she had been so sick. She'd had so many tubes that they didn't, they didn't embalm her. 
I prayed that she would wake up and scare the mortician, and I believed that she would. I knew he was going to bring her back to life, and he did not. I mean, she's alive in heaven. And we feel let down, like God, like God owed us something. I know. Like, like they're going to have a, an aha experience, an epiphany, and share that epiphany. I see the a heaven yeah. opening up and the angels, and I said the same thing to God. I don't remember if I wrote this in the book or not, but I could tell you this. <laughs> Yeah, I did write some uh -huh. of this in the book. Yeah. I said, I felt cheated. Uh -huh. This before God sent her back to visit me. I remember this conversation I put in there and said, I feel cheated. I expected some kind of uh, burst of energy yeah. for her to get up and say what yeah. she's seen. But you know what? I, I forgot when I wrote that, that I did, give, I did get two revelations while she was dying. One is when she saw her mother, and I talk about that just briefly, mm -hmm. because she didn't talk for two days, and she lost her voice and her mm -hmm. ability to respond mm -hmm. altogether. And she couldn't open up her eyes, but yet she saw yeah. Jesus and her mother on the other side, and yeah. she said something about that. And But in my grief, I didn't admit that right. at the time. I was still right. crying out for something. Mm -hmm. My name is Tiffany, and... Um, I just wanted to uh, say a little something about the Dream Catcher, Catch Your Dream Journal. Now before this book, I did used to dream, but it was probably maybe like one dream a week, like one good dream a week that had like substance in it. Well after I got this book, I was dreaming every single night. This book filled up with my dreams within three months, and I was in need of another book. And so I said to Miss Robin, I said, it's like your books are like a dream catalyst that enables you to just dream more and hear more from the Lord. Now, I needed another book, so I got two so that I can be prepared. I should probably get three. But it's a great book, and you should make sure that you get one. But there's a whole series of other little things I talk about God in the details. I, I don't know anybody in my entire life that ever had accrued a full year's worth of leave. You were able to leave work with pay. With pay to take care of her. For a year to take care of her. And serving under a Christian supervisor who told me it was the right thing to do. Wow. And wow. that you would accrue more time while you're taking the time. Because <laughs> you're still working. Because you're in a paid status. Yes. And my wife also had more than a year's worth of sick leave and accrued time because she had 30 years on the job. So she was still getting so, compensated. Yeah, and there's and the amount of money she had left over came took care exact amount of the, all three funerals together. Wow! Uh, which was a uh, another miracle by itself. God was your provider. He was yeah. he, he was sustained even in this. Even that, in the whole state of Tennessee. There was only one department that was allowed to earn overtime in the year 2008-9. And Every, it was just... Nobody else was allowed to earn it because we were going through a recession. Right, and right. 2000, yeah, yeah, 2008 is when it came. I was putting up all that leave right. for what God knew I would need in 2012 mm -hmm. when he would allow her to undergo this cancer. Mm. I talk about how three of six people were healed in the miracle service, but she wasn't one of them. Yeah. And they held the miracle service with her in mind. Yeah. And I said, Lord, why, why the others it's and so not her? It's so hard not to you go know? by me. <laughs> and you look back and you, we, we, we understand now yeah. why. Yes. He was basically saying, little do you know, yeah. you're about ready to fulfill your legacy in a great way and that you'll win more people to Christ yes. through your death and through yes. your life. He's fulfilling the desires of her heart, which is his word. That's what he says he would do, and that's yeah. what he's done. She was so concerned about that. She did his work to the very, very end. Yes. To the very end. There's several miracles uh, we haven't talked about here, because I don't want to tell everybody all of the miracles. Right. But I tell people, don't, don't just play Bible roulette and just open up the Bible, because sometimes if you don't have a lot of faith, you can just open up the, hey, Judas hung himself. <laughs> Go do likewise on the next one. Yeah. That's what it's all about, you know? <laughs> True. <laughs> but but I, I was very faithful, and I really I was crying out in, in desperation, Lord help me, mm -hmm. when I opened up a devotional that was a year old. And my pastor, Johnny Minnick, at the time, had written this devotional. Uh, both sides had a very similar lesson. I just happened to open it up, and I said, Lord, speak to me. And 
On the left side, the lesson was after 40 years of roaming in the wilderness, God calls his people into a new promised land. Mm. And, um, and then the one on the right side was uh, God gives new tools to his people after 40 years to fight the giants and fulfill their plan, their legacy. So you know how long I knew my wife, mm -hmm. right? 40 years 40 to that years. month. 40 years to that month. Mm. It was exact. Wow. Uh, wow, two really strong lessons that were so exact with the 40 mm. year stuff and with the application. And they kept happening, you know, mm -hmm. with the leave, you know. Mm -hmm. The phone call, Wayne, your leave just ran out this morning, right after she comes back. My leave ran out. Actually, that day they called me. <laughs> to the very day. And wow. then her employer calls me and says, guess what? Mm. Her leave has not run out. She still has enough left that we're going to write you a check for $22,000 if you'll come pick it up. Wow. And, of course, I'll ask you a rhetorical question. <laughs> you, you can answer this if you want, but I had three funerals on my wife. The cost of the casket, wow. the cost of Woodfin Funeral Home, River of Life, tribute service and things there and the transport to Alabama with a service there. Right. And how much do you think all this came to the cost of all these three funerals? $22,000. These are passive miracles yeah. that have an absolute application yes, yes. to show God is in the details. Yes. I'm working behind the scenes to do everything I can, yes. Wayne, because this is going to yes. culminate mm -hmm. in something that needs mm -hmm. to be acknowledged yes. and shared among people yes. that I might be glorified. Yes and that more people would come to mm -hmm. Christ and know that He's real. Mm -hmm. Wow. And in the midst of it, the enemy is attacking you at, at the very thing that you make your livelihood from. You know, He didn't attack your physical health. He attacked you with grief and, and the mental anguish. That's how you make your livelihood, is helping other people with grief and, you know, their mental anguish, that's where he attacks you. But the enemy always attacks our gifts. He's always going to attack where you're gifted. He wants to stop what it is God is using. We've been talking about 300 billion to one, a beautiful love story. Someone wrote, I was reading in the Amazon re, uh, reviews, that it's the equivalent to the notebook. And if you saw the movie, The Notebook, this is the Christian version of The Notebook. A happier version. A happier version, a, a inspiration, a true inspiration. Check it out. Get it. Get one for you and get one for someone else. If you've loved someone, you'll want to get this book. And if you have lost someone, you'll want to get this book. Wayne, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. People are going to be changed because of this. Her legacy goes on. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Next time on Dreamcatcher, Tiffany dreams that her car was set on fire, which leads to her being investigated. Later, she has a dream within a dream. Kendra dreams of lots of desserts, but the one she chooses is a cake shaped like a bunny rabbit. Find out what the Lord is saying to Tiffany and to Kendra next time, right here on Dreamcatcher, and catch your dreams.